<laughs> and it took a, a it was a 14 month process okay. while the Lord began to call me to do this thing. And I started on the streets of Soweto, which is a large ghetto. Um, it was in the middle of the apartheid years in South Africa. Oh yes, yes. Um, Soweto has a. It would. Soweto is what Harlem or the Bronx would be to New York. Right. But yes. multiply that many times. Many times. And uh, I went in there. It, it was at a time the people were very suppressed. Uh, they were hurting badly. Yes. They, they were, were doing necklace murders where they would put a motor car tire around the person's neck and then they would fill it with gas and make the victim set himself alight. Oh. So people said they'll kill you. They'll just burn you to death. But I said, no, the Lord has told me to do this thing. Uh, he said, go and start there. And I went in and just began to love the people. Yes. And we saw their hearts begin to melt. We just began to weep they together. They hadn't had any love from any source. From any side. You know, um, family, life had been, uh, family life had been difficult for them. They'd been suppressed under the apartheid regime. Right. They'd been treated without dignity. Yes. And, and the Lord wanted to restore their dignity by just loving them. Right. So I went in and just began to love them. And that was the launching pad for me walking through 67 towns and cities more than uh, 3,500 kilometers through our own nation, which uh -huh. took two and a half years. And we began to see God move in a mighty way. And we thought that was a mission. My church just released me um, to, to do, do a mission. Okay. But it actually turned into a ministry 13 years later. I'm still walking. Uh -huh. so, and, and God has t uh, allowed us to minister to many nations, more than 17 nations in a meaningful way. Okay. I've been to more than double that. but. Uh, I don't say I've been to a nation unless I've ministered properly there. Right, mm. okay. Well, this is what is so awesome. What has that become of your church now? What are they doing in, in your absence? Oh, <laughs> um, it, it's interesting. They, um, they, they see me as one who is sent from them. Yes, I um, think they do. I, I kind of, I, I, we've made home in another city now, and um, <clears throat> we're in the city of Port Elizabeth, okay. which is an east coast city in South Africa. <clears throat> Pardon me. But um, that church uh, still love me and cheer me on. Right. And uh, You belong to them. You can't get away. Yeah, I, I always say I'm not, um, I'm not apart from the church. Right. I'm a part of the church. I see myself as one who is sent. Mm -hmm. And so that is, uh, they still love me and are in communication. I go there regularly. Um, and we, we have a lovely, warm relationship. I'm certain mm -hmm. that you do. Um, the Lord impressed me with a scripture, and I think this is where I would like to share it, because um, before Dave got here today, the Lord just impressed me with a scripture, and I believe that he is speaking of this, and it is about Dave. It is out of Isaiah chapter 42, and I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Version, and I will be starting at verse 5, and I will be skipping through that in case you should like to pick up your Bible and find it. It says, Thus says God the Lord, <clears throat> He who created the heavens and stretched them forth, He who spread abroad the earth and that which comes out of it, He who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. And the Lord says, I will give you for a covenant to the people, for a light to the nations, and when I read that part, he was letting me know that he was speaking to me about Dave Cape. And so therefore, I wanted to read this scripture to you. And he gave Dave to us to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, and to those who sit in darkness from the prison. I am the Lord, that, my, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another nor my praise to graven images. And the Lord will go forth like a mighty man. He will rouse up his zealous indignation and vengeance like a warrior. He will cry, yes, he will shout aloud, and he will do mightily against his enemies. And thus says the Lord, I have for a long time held my peace. I have been still and I have restrained myself, but now I will cry out like a woman in travail, and I will gasp and pant together. And Dave, I might tell you that when I was reading that 
that one scripture, it was like, your ministry, God is going to use this to cry out now. This is a message that I believe the Lord is wanting for as much of the world to hear as is possible. He says, I will bring the blind by a way that they know not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness into light before them and make uneven places into a plain. These things I have determined to do for them, and I will not leave them forsaken. Take God's word to heart. Dave, you have ministered on this word. So what would you like to add to that? What is the Lord saying to you? Bertha, I, I was so excited when Bertha read this to me uh, just a, a few minutes back. And I really just, because I've ministered on this word many times, I'd like to just comment on two things um, where you were just saying you feel that it's a prophetic word about yes, our ministry. Yes, I do. Um, uh, we honestly believe that the whole servant heart of Jesus uh, is a truth that is being restored to the yes. body of Christ. Yes. Um, you know, very often within Christian circles, people use the Holy Spirit as a cliche yes. rather than a person. Yes. And I think that servanthood often gets relegated to the same kind of treatment in that everybody wants to be servants, but they're not quite sure how to be servants, mm -hmm. or they have the wrong concept of servanthood. Yeah. And I do a, a series called A Celebration of Servanthood, where I go into churches and I share the overflow of this. But the Lord said to me that He will allow through what we teach and what we share that servanthood will not be something that people do, but something that, uh, that they are. Um, there. And, there and, and, and I really feel that that's one of the truths that, that God is busy restoring and, mm -hmm. and that we're hoping to do through God's secret to greatness. But when you shared that our ministry will be a light to the Gentiles, um, one of the things that happened during the Gulf War, uh, we had uh, been out of our home for more than two and a half years, uh, Carol and I wanted to just have a break with our children and just restore our souls and uh, it had been a, a very a strenuous two years for us and uh, at the end of, uh, of that time we just wanted to come back in our home, fix it up, just have a bit of a break before we went out again. Be and, and yeah, and during that time I had this picture of Jesus standing weeping over Kuwait. Now this was prior to the Gulf uh, conflict. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Eventually, this burden wouldn't leave me, and I went down and I woke Carol up and I said, you know, I've just got this picture of Jesus weeping over Kuwait, and she said, oh, go to sleep. <laughs> well, neither of us slept that night, and we wrestled with the angel of God for two weeks, and eventually I said, well, I need to go to the Middle East. And I headed out, and when I got to London, the Gulf War broke out. At that time, you couldn't travel freely on a South African passport, so I thought that that would be the way in. Uh, and I'm picking up on your thought of the light to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. What transpired at that point was that um, we, I eventually met the man who had been one of the commanders of the, uh, of the British forces in the Falcons, and he got me in. Uh, and uh, I, worked along the, uh, I worked along the border of Iraq and Turkey. Yes. And unbeknown to me, I carried the cross and bowl into, um, into Kurdistan which I didn't know at the time was an unreached people group for the gospel. Oh. And I just kind of walked in there. But God knew. God knew. Uh -huh. And I, I had my Muslim interpreter with me, who eventually became a Christian. And we walked in there, and it was very, very difficult and very dangerous. And the reality was that um, straight after the war, a man in London wrote to my wife and said that they now knew of 20 converts as a result of us going in there. And it opened up the way for Operation Mobilization and YWAM to go and establish bases. Oh, wonderful. So, just confirming that your scripture is a real confirmation of that. Now, I wanted to um, pick up a, a, and share a, a fairly um, lengthy story on uh -huh. uh, making rugged places into planes. And, um, well, a, and I, but I think we're a little bit short of time, so maybe I think so. another it's, time. If you will just hold steady, we will get that story from you. Because, <laughs> Dave, I can't let you go now. You've just got my curiosity going, and I know all of you are so interested, too. 
that you we've just got to have Dave stay with us and talk with us a little bit more. But would you extend a blessing over the people that are watching today yeah. before we close? I'd love to do that, Bertha. Thank you. Um, Folk, I, I want to say to you, if you've been sitting at home and you uh, have been listening to the, the things that Bertha and I have been sharing, and, and some of the stories that I've shared, which I haven't really got into, I'm trusting that in the next program I'll be able to just share more of what takes place when I'm actually out on the road. You, you might wonder about a miracle working God, and, and you may be sitting at home with an incredible burden that you're carrying and you're just trusting God and you're begging Him for the breakthrough and you're saying it's fine uh, for, uh, for God to work in you, Dave, and in Bertha. I want to say as you sit at home tonight that God is a miracle working God yes. and you're standing yes. on the edge of the miracle tonight. Yes. And all you need to do is to come and just allow Him to take hold of your life and surrender yes. uh, where you are. Just lay the burden at the foot of the cross. But don't come for the miracle of God. Come for the God of the miracle. And if you, if you understand that God sent His Son Jesus to die for you, and you appropriate that blessing for yourself fully tonight, God is able to break through in your situation and cause your miracle. You're standing on the edge of your miracle. I want you, where you're sitting right at home, just to begin to reach out and uh, just, just extend your hand to, toward our hands as we reach out to you in your living room, wherever you may be, the hotel room that you're watching in, and reach out for your miracle right now. And just begin to uh, ask God, and, and ask by asking Jesus to, uh, to come into your heart. We're going to pray that prayer with you right now. Let's, uh, let's just uh, bow before the Lord, and just let's ask Jesus, firstly, to come into your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, that person out there that needs the miracle tonight. We ask you, Father God, to help them to lay down those things that have hindered them from being the man or the woman of God that they desire to be and that you desire for them to be. Just where you are right now, just say, Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you love me. And that you died for me. And that you died for me. I ask you. I ask you. To come into my heart. To come into my heart. And forgive me my sins. And forgive me my sins. And set me free. And set me free. In Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. And so, Lord Jesus, right now we ask for a miracle in, in this dear person's life that's watching right now. Yes. Lord Jesus, we ask you, we thank you, Lord, that you said that you have placed all things in subjection that's beneath right. our feet. And so, Lord, as this new believer comes before you right now, yes. help them to understand that the burden that they carry and the breakthrough that they need is subject to the miracle working power of Jesus. In his precious name. Amen. Amen. And good night. We'll see you the next time.